Okay, so this is the second video in looking at Edexcel B1, and today I'd just like to have a look at uh, variation within biology, evolution, and the genetic causes for evolution. So let's start with a definition. Let's start with the definition of variation. So variation is defined as the differences among a species so the differences differences among or within or within a species so, for example, if you think of humans, there's lots of variation among humans. We have people with black hair, people with blonde hair, people with red hair, people who have no hair at all. We have people with different coloured eyes, different coloured skin. But we also have people with various other differences, such as scars, tattoos, um, piercings, things like that. These all contribute to variation. These are all differences within a species. The Species such as dogs are highly varied. There's lots of variation among dogs. If you think of the difference between a Chihuahua and a Great Dane, or between a Pug, for example, and an Alsatian, there's lots of differences. Okay? But why do we need this variation? Well, why why is the variation important? Well, variations needed to allow organisms to live in the different environments that we find across the globe. So variation allows allows organisms to live. in different conditions around the world. So this variation basically allows organisms to occupy all the different areas we see them living in. For example, polar bears have white fur that allows them to camouflage into their environment. We have um, they have lots of blubber that allows them to stay warm. They have large feet that stops them slipping on any sort of slippery ice or snow or sinking into the snow. At the same time, we have cactus which have uh, these this thick layer on their stem, the green part that stops water evaporating. They have these large roots that allow them to absorb water from the ground in dry conditions. We also have, uh, they also have spines on them that stop other organisms from eating them. Okay, so this variation can also become adaptations. Okay, which we'll talk about in a moment. So variation, there's two types. So there's two types of variation. There are two types of variation. Dot dot. The first type is genetic variation. Genetic variation. Now, genetic variation is caused by an organism's DNA. Okay, so genetic variation is caused by an organism's DNA. Caused by an organism's DNA or their genetic material. So these are the things that are passed from parent to child. So they're passed from parent to child. Okay? 
Here, you'll often be asked about a key word. This key word is mutation. Mutation. Now, a mutation is a change in an organism's DNA. Okay? So it's a change in an organism's DNA. Change in an organism's DNA or genetic material. And what this does is it brings about different variation. So, for example, there may be a mutation in a human or an, another animal that causes albinoism, which causes them to be very, very pale, very pale skin, very pale hair, pale eyes. This is a mutation, and it causes variation within the gene pool. These are a good thing. We'll talk about this later. Second the second type of variation is environmental variation. So environmental, environmental variation. Okay. Now environmental variation is slightly different because it's not caused by their DNA. Environmental variation is caused by the environment caused by environment. Now, this could be anything. For example, if you decide to dye your hair, that is from your environment. It's not caused by your DNA, but it does cause variation. If you dye your hair green, for example, you can't get green hair through your DNA, but you can get it from your environment. But obviously, things such as green hair through hair dye cannot be passed to children. So these can't be passed to children. Can't be passed to offspring. Okay? So these cannot be passed on. For example, if if something terrible was to happen to me, um and I was to lose one of my limbs, for example, let's let's surmise I lose an arm. If I then go on to have a child with my wife my child would, would have two arms, hopefully. That that would not be passed on to my offspring. Okay, so these are known as acquired characteristics. Acquired characteristics. So this is acquired characteristics. Acquired characteristics. Now, acquired characteristics are characteristics that can be changed by the environment. So, characteristics, characteristics that can be changed by the environment okay so environmental variation is caused by the environment it can't be passed on to offspring and these are known as acquired characteristics things like these could be for example tattoos so we could have tattoos if my pen will work tattoos we could have piercings we could have scars. We could have dyed hair and so on and so forth. None of these things can be passed on to offspring. Okay? Now, these, these characteristics can be shown by a normal distribution curve. Now, a normal distribution curve is a graph that has this peak in the middle. We have it going from low up to a peak and then back down to low. And it shows that you have the most common organ, the common characteristics in the middle, and you have the most extreme characteristics either side. Okay? But this is also down to something called continuous variation. So if we wipe the board and I can go over this with you. 
So set this back to black, as Amy Winehouse would say. Put it back to, we'll go green, just the pen. In fact, no, I'll do a table. So there's two types of variation or two types of data. We can have continuous data. Continuous variation. And we can also have discrete variation. Okay? Discrete or discontinuous variation. Discontinuous variation. Now, the reason I mention discrete is because I like to think of this as the same principle as you've probably discussed in maths. You have continuous data and discrete data. Continuous variation, continuous variation, is where a characteristic. So this is where a characteristic varies along a spectrum or range. So, for example, so for example, height. You could have someone who is 100 centimetres tall up to, to someone who is 250 centimetres tall, okay? And everybody else would be in the middle, okay? We would have the smallest height, the smallest person, and the tallest. And we could have someone who's 100.01, 100.02, 100.03, 100.04, and keep going all the way up until we get to 250 centimetres. This is data that is very difficult to put into groups, okay? So height would be an example of this. Another one would be weight. And another one could be shoe uh, well, not so much shoe size, but uh, hand width. Okay? This continuous data, on the other hand, is a characteristic that can be put into groups. So a characteristic that can be put into groups. Now, this could include eye colour, blood group, etc., etc. So, for example, eye colour, blood group, or gender. You're either a boy or a girl. You either have A blood group, B blood group, A B blood group. You either have blue eyes, brown eyes, green eyes, or in some cases, grey eyes. Okay? So continuous variation is where it's a longer range. You have from the smallest to the tallest. And discontinuous variation is where it can be put into groups. Okay? Now, usually... Usually, as a rule of thumb, this would be your genetic variation. Genetic variation. Whereas your continuous variation would be environmental. Now, of course, this is a very general statement. Because, for example, of course you get, some, to some degree, your height from your parents. But it all depends on your environment in the terms of how much food you're given. If you've got two twins who have exactly the same uh, genes, they have exactly the same genetic information, and you give one lots of food growing up and one not much, the one who's had lots of food will 
probably be taller than what the one who isn't. Okay? Continuous variation, which is this one on our left column, can be shown using something called a distribution curve, a normal distribution curve. So if we were to plot our results on a graph, what you would often find is with continuous variation, with environmental variation, you'll find that there'll be a small point that turns up into a bell and then a low point okay most individuals will be around the average so if we're looking at height for example in our example here we could say that the most average height would be in the middle we'd probably have people who are um, 160 centimeters tall but then at either end of the spectrum you'll have less people who are at this extreme and less people who are at this extreme so you'll have far less people who are found near the lower end of the range, less people who are found near the upper end of the range, but also a lot of people who are found in the middle. This is known as a normal distribution curve. So a normal distribution curve. Okay, so let's have a look at this first question. This is a worked answer for an exam style question that you may have. And the question says, describe the type of variation shown in this graph and explain why it shows an acquired characteristic. So if we look at this graph, we have got a distribution curve. We've got very few people at this extreme. We've got very few people at this extreme, but we've got lots of people in the middle. And as we said, this would be like our bell curve. This would be our normal distribution curve. It would be on a range. This would be continuous variation caused by the environment. So the answer is said, the graph shows continuous variation in height between 4 and 8 centimetres. This bell shape is called a normal distribution curve, which shows that the most common height is between 5 and 6 centimetres, and that the frequency of each height group decreases from the most common to the extremes of the range. Height is an acquired characteristic because it is affected by differences in the environment. So height would be would be an example of it being affected by your environment in the sense that if you do not have enough food you won't grow as tall okay so what I would like you to do I would like you to pause the video now and either discuss with someone or on a piece of paper have a go at writing these answers down and then we'll mark them Okay, so hopefully you pause the video when I asked you to pause it. So you should now have some answers for the questions that are currently on the screen. The first question says, Arctic foxes have thick fur and are white in winter. Explain how these characteristics are and are adaptations to its environment. Now, adaptations are something that we haven't really discussed as of yet. Okay? So, if we go back to here, we can define an adaptation. So, adaptation. It does not have to be in this column but usually adaptations are genetic okay but it doesn't necessarily have to be so an adaptation is defined as a characteristic a characteristic that helps an organism survive in its environment okay so a adaptation 
is a characteristic that helps an organism survive in its environment. Okay? So if we go back to our question, the Arctic foxes have thick fur and are white in winter. Two marks. Explain how these characteristics are adaptations to its environment. So an Arctic fox lives in cold environments. It lives in, say, one of the poles. So the thick fur keeps it warm. If you said that the thick fur keeps it warm, you get one mark. Your second mark comes from saying that the white fur allows the Arctic fox to be camouflaged and therefore less likely to be seen, um, and it stops its prey from seeing it so it can hunt. That is your second mark. So thick fur for keeping warm, white fur so it can be camouflaged from its prey. Can I point out, being camouflaged does not just mean you can hide from predators. It means you can also hide from your prey and, and sneak up on it before you eat it. Write down your own definitions for these terms. Discontinuous variation. You should have said that variation that occurs in discrete groups, where it is not possible to have a variation that falls between the groups. So discontinuous variation is where it cannot be in between groups. So for example, eye colour is either blue, brown, green, or sometimes white or grey. You can't have purple. You can't have orange eyes. Okay? Acquired characteristic. Acquired characteristic is a characteristic characteristic that varies as a result of the effects of the environment. So acquired characteristics are usually environmental things, okay? They're usually environmental variation and therefore they are a result of the environment. Finally, a normal distribution curve is a graph of continuous variation that shows a typical bell shape with measurements within the range being more common than measurements nearer the extremes. So this would be this here. Okay, we've got the most common in the middle. We've got a lot of organisms in the middle that are found and are the most common. And then at both extremes, near the lower end and the higher end, we've got less and less organisms. Okay. So, hopefully you did relatively well at that. If you didn't do very well at it, come and find me. And obviously I can go through these things with you in a bit more detail. Right then. So, on to something a little bit more different. Okay. So, that's variation. But why? Is there so much variation in life? If we found one organism that was able to survive, why do we need all these different ones? Why can't we just have that one and be like them? Well, this is due to something called evolution by natural selection. Okay? So, evolution and natural selection are two different things. And you need to know them for your Edexcel test. Okay? So evolution is defined as a change in species over time. Okay? So evolution is a change in species over time. Now, I need to point out here that this change over time is a very long time okay so we're talking millions of years unless you're talking about bacteria which can change literally within days natural selection on the other hand is due to variation okay so natural selection can be defined as the better Adapted, adapted organisms are more likely 
to survive and pass on their genes. Okay, just need to have a quick swig of water. So we've got evolution, which is a change in species over time. This is a very long time, over millions of years. And we've got natural selection, where the better adapted organisms are more likely to survive and pass on their genes. But the important thing here is that in any population, we have a lot of variation. So in any population, there is a lot of variation okay and it's this variation through natural selection that allows organisms to be selected okay so so let's have a think about evolution okay we are going to think about stick men and we're going to start with two we're going to start with two parents okay we've got one male that's the white one and we'll have a yellow one which is the female doesn't really matter which way around it is this will all make sense in a minute okay so these are our original parents these are the parents now evolution states that organisms will always have more offspring than are likely to survive and because these are yellow and uh, or yellow and white, sorry, variation, genetic variation, means that the children are more likely to acquire their characteristics. So we may have three white stick men produced by these two parents. We may have three yellow stick men produced by these parents because they're having lots of offspring like so but due to mutations we may have a blue stick man produced like so due to a mutation and we may even have a red stick man produced due to a mutation okay so we can say that parents have more offspring than are likely to survive likely to survive and then due to mutations and variation there will be variation in the offspring produced so we can say uh, which color shall we go for we'll switch to no we'll stick with white but I'm after so due to mutation we get the blue and the red one but due to normal genetic inheritance we get these ones which we'll talk about in a minute now I want you to suppose that there is over many generations these organisms have reproduced passed on their their genes to other generations including the red and blue ones I want you to imagine that there's a change in the environment and this change in the environment means that only red and blue red and blue stick men survive so we need a red one like so and we need a blue one like so so we can say due to a change in the environment 
only red and blue stickmen survive the others have all died now this could be due to anything this could be due to disease famine um, not being able to find a mate whatever but the important thing is that due to a change in the environment all the others have died and only those ones survive that is a process of natural selection okay natural selection has selected the best adapted ones for this environment so that would be natural selection then what would happen is the red and blue ones that are left over would go on to reproduce and that would produce mainly red and blue stickmen like so and again because we've only got red and blue stickmen you'll have mainly red stickmen mainly blue stickmen as well and then due to mutation you may once again get a white one or a yellow one or due to the laws of inheritance okay but what we can see is that over time we've had this change in the organisms we started with white and yellow ones they had lots of offspring which all showed variation some of it may have been due to mutations like these red and blue ones the change in the environment meant that they all died apart from the red and blue ones and therefore the next generation was mainly red and blue stick men and very few yellow ones this change is known in known as evolution okay in fact it is evolution by natural selection so whenever you have an exam question on evolution by natural selection you should always start to say that parents have more offspring than are likely to survive one mark these offspring show variation this could be due to genetic environmental or mutation a change in the environment will mean that the best adapted ones will survive and pass on their genes to the next generation this process is known as natural selection once they pass on these genes there may be a change in the organisms over time resulting in evolution okay so so what we need to look at now worked example the question says explain how geographical isolation geographical isolation meaning that a mountain or a river has got in the way so geographical isolation could result in the evolution of a new species so I want you to imagine that we've got a group of organisms on an island like so if we rub the board off Uh, we've got an island like so and on this island we've got our stick men that we had before we've got the white ones we've got the yellow ones okay like so and geographical isolation may take place okay which would mean that the island becomes separated it becomes separated into two parts so if we rub out part of the island and we add in uh, lines again like so becomes separated this is known as geographical isolation so geographical isolation we've separated the population and what may happen is over time the conditions in both of these areas 
will change. So this island may become predominantly yellow and this island may become predominantly blue, say. Um, let's see if we could use, so you can see, oh, this island becomes predominantly blue, okay? Obviously, on this island, the ones that are more likely to survive are the yellow ones. They're more likely to survive, reproduce, and go on to have offspring of their own. Whereas, unfortunately, these white ones are likely to die out. On this island, you may have started with some white stick men and some yellow stick men, but due to mutations, you may have found that there was, by chance, a blue stick man born. And this one would be more likely to survive and therefore pass on his genes. And over time, these other ones would die out. Okay? So, if we have a look back at the answer that has been given to the exam question we were looking at, says, explain how geographical isolation could result in the evolution of a new species. Some individuals get separated from the rest of the population, e.g. on a different island. The different conditions in the new place will select for different variations. Evolution by natural selection will change the characteristics of the individuals in the new place. And over time, eventually the individuals in the new place may change so much that they can no longer breed with the rest of the species. Remember, a species is a group of organisms that can reproduce to produce fertile offspring. If they change so much genetically, they may no longer recognize each other. And as a result, they become different species. So, at this point, I'd like you to pause the video. I'd like you to either write down or discuss with someone the answers to these questions. And in a minute, we'll come back together and mark them. Off you go. Okay, so hopefully you've had a go at these two questions. Let's have a look at answers and see if we can mark them. So the first question says, describe the difference and link between natural selection and evolution. Four marks, okay? This question is out of four marks. Therefore, it wants you to do four things. It wants you to describe the difference between natural selection and evolution two marks and it wants you to describe the link between natural selection and evolution so you should have said that natural selection is the effect of the environment on individuals so that those that are better adapted are more likely to survive so i repeat natural selection is the effect of the environment on individuals so, so that those which are better adapted are more likely to survive and therefore, for your second mark, they're more likely to pass on their genes with adaptations to their offspring. So those with the best adaptations are more likely to survive. For one mark, second mark, as they've survived, they're more likely to pass on their adaptations to offspring. Your third mark comes from saying evolution is the gradual change in organisms over time. So evolution is the gradual change in organisms over time. Fourth mark, this is due to natural selection. So my advice here is if ever you see keywords that I've defined in green in lessons, define them. If you define these keywords, you get those marks. Okay? Next one, which should take us on to the next part of the lesson, which takes us just over halfway. Explain how a similarity in DNA between species provides evidence for evolution. Okay, so species that have separated more recently through evolution will share more similar DNA. So the more similar DNA you have, the more recent you had a common ancestor with that organism. So for example, it, it's very commonly reported that we have in the high 90% common DNA with um, chimpanzees 
but we also have about 95-96% in common with a mouse. But because it's 99% with a chimp and 95% with a mouse, we're more closely related to the chimp than we are to the mouse. So you've got a mark for saying the more common DNA there is, the more related the organisms are. And then the second mark comes from saying the less common DNA there is, the less related we are to the, organism, to the other organism. Okay, so hopefully that made a bit more sense. So let's start having a look at cells. Okay, if we think of a cell, a normal animal cell, in year seven and eight, you should have looked at this. An animal cell consists of a cell membrane inside of which is the nucleus. Now, obviously, I can't do it in, in black, so I'll have to do it in blue. So, inside which we've got a nucleus, okay? So, if that's a nucleus, the white bit around the outside is the cell membrane, but for now, we'll just label it as a cell, okay? Inside the nucleus is the genetic material, okay? So the nucleus of a cell stores genetic material. So the nucleus stores genetic material. And usually this genetic material is really stringy. But during cell division, we get something called chromosomes. Okay? So inside this nucleus, so if we do a dashed line like so, so hopefully you can see that it's from the nucleus, we have something called chromosomes. Chromosomes. And chromosomes look a little bit like this. Okay? Fantastic art skills there. That would be one chromosome. And that would be two chromosomes. Okay? Like so. And essentially all a chromosome is, is a coiled up piece of DNA. So chromosomes, chromosomes are a coiled up piece of DNA. So, coiled DNA. Now, we essentially have genes on these chromosomes. So, these chromosomes on them have genes. Okay? So, you'll always have a center part there. And in the middle, or not just in the middle, around them, we have genes. So, for example, you may have a gene here, and the same gene here. I'll explain why in a moment. And then you may have another gene here. And on this side, in the same position, but a different colour, you'll have another gene. Okay? So, a gene is defined as a short piece of DNA. So, a gene is defined as a short piece of DNA. Short piece of DNA that codes for a characteristic. That codes for a characteristic. Okay? So, for example, these two genes here may be for hair colour. Okay? So, these ones here may be for hair colour, whereas these ones here may be for eye colour. But the problem is that, obviously, these two are the same. However, this one has different ones, okay? Now, the reason for this is 
the chromosomes are separated into two parts. You have your maternal chromosomes. These are the ones that come from your mom. And you have paternal ones, which come from your dad. Now, both of these chromosomes, the one from mom and the one from dad, contain exactly the same genes. Okay? So, like I said, this one here may be for, eye co uh, for hair colour, sorry, we said, didn't we? This one may be for hair colour, whereas these ones may be for eye colour. They're at exactly the same points. Okay, so they're found in exactly the same position on the chromosome, and they are code for exactly the same thing. Okay, now these positions on the chromosome are known as loci. Loci. And loci can be defined, the position in which A gene is found on a chromosome. Okay? So, we've got the nucleus in the cell, which contains genetic material. This genetic material can coil up to form a chromosome. A chromosome is a coiled piece of DNA. These chromosomes have genes on them. Genes are short pieces of DNA that code for characteristics. They are found at loci on a chromosome. So the loci for hair colour would be the same on the paternal chromosome, the one you got from your dad, and the same on the maternal chromosome, the one you got from your mum. So these chromosomes are in the same position. However, sometimes they can be the same, and sometimes they can be different okay if they are different they are known as alleles alleles a l l e l e s now alleles are different forms different forms of the same gene okay so they're different forms of the same gene so let me explain if I switch to red just to add to this for example eye color okay so your dad may have given you the eye color genes for blue eyes Let's say this is for blue eyes, whereas your mother gave you the eye colour for brown eyes. So we've got blue eyes from dad, brown eyes from mum. Whereas the hair colour may be blonde from both. These two alleles, these two genes, code for blonde hair, because they're found at the same loci, they're the same gene, so they're the same gene for hair colour. These genes are found at the same loci, again on the same chromosomes, but these code for eye colour and they are different, therefore they are alleles of each other, they are different forms of the same gene. We've got blue eyes and we've got brown eyes. Okay? Now, two words that you need to know is homozygous and heterozygous. Okay? homozygous and heterozygous so homozygous now as I mentioned in the previous video homo means the same zygous means genes so this person would be homozygous for hair color they have the same genes or the same alleles for hair color from mom and dad. So homozygous is defined as having the same allele at a loci. 
So having the same gene, the same allele, at a loci on the same chromosomes. Okay? On chromosomes. On the other hand, heterozygous, heterozygous, which means different, means that organisms have different alleles at the same loci. So heterozygous means having different alleles at a loci on chromosomes. Okay? So this person would be homozygous for hair colour. They have the same gene at this loci on both chromosomes, the one from mum and the one from dad. Whereas for eye colour, they are heterozygous. Hetero means different. So they have different genes at the same loci. They have brown eyes and blue eyes. Okay? So for future reference, homo, homo means same and hetero means different. Okay? So, these are all some definitions about genetics. These are all things, these are the basic ideas for genetics. You have your cells, which have a nucleus inside of them. Inside the nucleus is genetic material. This genetic material can be coiled up to form chromosomes. These chromosomes have genes on them. For each chromosome, you get one from your mom, one from your dad. They have the same genes on them at the same loci. Loci are the positions where they're found. So, for example, you can't have eye colour here and then eye colour here on this one. They will always be found at exactly the same point. Okay? These are known as loci. If they are different forms of the same gene, these are known as alleles. Okay? So, they are alleles. There's just a couple more example, uh, keywords I need to give you before we move on. So, I'm going to have to rub this off. Like so. And we need to get a couple more definitions down. So, genotype. Your genotype is defined as all of the alleles in your body. So, all of the alleles, all alleles in an individual. Okay, so it could be all of the genetic material of an individual. On the other hand, your phenotype, your phenotype is defined as the characteristics, the characteristics produced by a genotype okay so for example you may have the genes for blue eyes but you you have the gene for blue eyes therefore your phenotype would show that you have blue eyes okay you may have one gene for blue eyes one gene for brown eyes but your phenotype would be brown eyes, even though you have an allele for blue eyes and an allele for brown eyes. This is due to something called dominant and recessive genes. Okay? So, dominant alleles, so dominant alleles are always shown in the phenotype are always shown 
in the phenotype okay do not say so one thing that a lot of people do and it's wrong do not say that it's bigger and stronger okay so dominant alleles are not bigger and stronger than recessive ones it's just that dominant alleles are always shown in the phenotype if there is a dominant allele present it is always shown in the characteristics of the person so do not say they're stronger okay they're not stronger that's wrong you need to just say that they're always shown in the phenotype okay the final keyword that I want to get down before we have a look at diagrams in a little while is recessive alleles recessive alleles now recessive alleles are only shown are only shown in the phenotype if the person is homozygous for the recessive allele so what that basically means is that you will only ever show recessive alleles if you have two of them if you have one recessive allele on your mother's on the chromosome given from your mother and a recessive allele on the same loci on a chromosome given from your father from your dad okay now the last thing before i give you a quick question to do is that before we move on dominant alleles are always shown with capital letters capital letters and recessive alleles are always shown with lower case uh, letters okay keep that in mind as we need to move as we move on to the next lesson but for now what i would like you to do is i would like you to pause the video please and i would like you to attempt these questions that are currently on the screen off you go okay then so hopefully by now you've had a go at those questions okay so the first question says distinguish between the terms chromosome gene and allele for one mark you needed to say that a chromosome was a long strand of dna so long as you say that a chromosome is a really long strand of dna or a coiled up piece of dna you get a mark second one a gene a gene is a small section of dna that provides a particular characteristic so a gene is a small section of dna that provides a characteristic and thirdly an allele is an alternative form of a gene so a different form of the same gene okay a pea plant has a recessive allele for white flower colour and a dominant allele for purple flower colour. Identify if the plant is homozygous or heterozygous and explain your answer. Two marks. So remember, hetero means different, homo means the same. This one has a recessive for white and a dominant for purple, so they are different, therefore it is heterozygous. If you says it was heterozygous, you got one mark. 
And for the second mark, you needed to say, because it has one dominant and one recessive allele. <coughs> Final question. State the phenotype of the plant for the flower. Explain your answer. Now, remember, this dominant allele is purple. So the phenotype would be that it would have purple flowers. That would give you one mark. If you have purple flower, if you said purple flowers, one mark. Then your second mark comes from saying because the purple allele is dominant. Okay, so it would have purple flowers because the purple allele is dominant. Final section. Final section where we need to think about something called a Punnett square. A Punnett square. Okay. So, this is spelt as such. A Punnett square. Okay. Now, a question that you could get is that a heterozygous plant breeds with another heterozygous plant They both have a dominant red allele and a recessive recessive uh, yellow allele. Predict predict the post the chance predict the chance of having a yellow offspring. Now, this would be worth a good five or six marks, okay? Because you essentially need to work out the crosses of the offspring. You need to draw a Punnett square and you also need to use the correct terminology okay so first things first it says here that they are both heterozygous okay so hetero means that they have one of each allele another bit of information we can take from this question is the fact that the red allele is dominant so if that is present it is always expressed whereas the yellow allele is recessive okay that needs two in order to be expressed so to start your Punnett square or start your genetic diagram you simply need to draw two lines as such what you then need to do is you need to write in the genotype for each one Okay. Now, the important thing here is when we're drawing Punnett squares, we always use the same letter. So, we always use the same letter. If you don't do this, you will lose a mark, and it's a silly mark to lose. All we do is that the dominant is shown with a capital whereas the recessive the recessive is shown with a lower case okay 
it doesn't matter what letter you use so long as you follow this rule the reason i say this is because it is a silly mark to lose okay it's it's crazy the amount of people even at a level that do this so they're heterozygous for petal color i'm going to use the letters r so capital r is my red allele and lowercase r is my yellow allele i'm going to do a key so that the examiner can see that i know what i'm on about like so so that's parent number one parent number one and down here we'll have parent number two and they are also recessive uh sorry heterozygous so we're looking for the chance of having a yellow offspring now we've said in the question that yellow is recessive Therefore, in order for the offspring to be yellow, they need to be homozygous recessive. Okay? They have two lowercase r's. So, all we do here is we go along and we fill in the two letters. So, we get an R from this parent and a capital R from this parent. This one would get a capital R from this parent and a lowercase r from this one. This one down here, we'll get a capital R from this one and a lowercase r from this one, like so. And this one will get two lowercase r's. Now we can literally go along and decide what type these would be. So this would be homozygous because it's got two capitals, homozygous. And because they're two capitals, it would be homozygous dominant. This one has got one capital and one lower. They're both different. So this one will be heterozygous. Same for this one. This one will be heterozygous. But this one on the end would be homozygous recessive. Homozygous recessive and if we now go along with a different color and work out what color they would actually be this one has a dominant red so it would have red leaves this one has a dominant red so it would have red leaves this one has a dominant red so it would have red leaves but this one doesn't have a dominant one. It has two lowercase ones. So this one would have yellow leaves. Now if we think of this as proportions, okay, we can say that each part is worth a quarter. So we've got, literally, we've got 25% being homozygous dominant. We've got 25 plus 25, 50% being heterozygous, and we've got 25% being homozygous recessive. So we can see that 25% of the offspring would be have yellow leaves, because the only 25% would be homozygous recessive. Okay? So if we have a look at a worked example of this, okay, it says green seed pods, capital G, are dominant to yellow seed pods, lowercase g. Notice that they're using a dominant and a lower, okay? It says complete the Punnett square to show the possible offspring for plants of heterozygous plant heterozygous for seed pod colour and calculate A the ratio b the probability and c the percentage okay so just like we've done they've put in the parents genotypes they've filled out the offspring's genotypes and then they've worked this out as a ratio so out of this three of every four children 
three are likely to have green, one yellow. So that would be a three to one ratio. Three green, one yellow. If we wanted to do that as probability, one out of four would have be homozygous dominant, two out of four would be heterozygous, and another one out of four would be homozygous recessive. Okay, so three quarters would be green and one quarter would be yellow. Finally, we could work that as a, as a percentage and say that 25%, because we've got 25, 50, 75, 100%, each one's worth 25%. We've got 25% being homozygous dominant, 50% being heterozygous, and then 25% being homozygous recessive. Now, as it says down here, take great care to complete the square correctly and make sure you use the right letters. This is where the amount of pupils are throw away stupid marks. This question has even given you the letters to use. So if they give you the letters to use, use the ones they've said. Okay? So, what I would like you to do is I would like you to complete this question and then we'll work through it together to find out the question answer. So if you'd like to pause the video here and then start it again once you're ready. Okay. So the question says, a heterozygous rabbit with a brown coat was bred with a rabbit with a black coat. The four baby rabbits were all black. Use a diagram to calculate the predicted outcome for this cross. So if we have a look, the fact that the majority of them come out as black rabbits means that the black allele must be the dominant one. Okay, it must be. But if we wanted to put this into a Punnett square, which is what you should have done, okay, like so, now we'll go white, and we put it into a Punnett square, okay? We could have had parent one, parent two, so parent one, and we've got parent two here. The question said that if we have a look, that a heterozygous rabbit with brown coat was bred. Okay? So we should have had heterozygous being like this. So we have the heterozygous having a capital B and a lowercase b. We know that that's heterozygous. Okay? We know that it's brown even. The other one, to be honest with you, would be lowercase. It would be a recessive allele. So if we go along and do our crosses, like so. Okay? Now, you should have worked out that the capital, the dominant one, was for brown, okay? Because it says that the rabbit is heterozygous and it has a brown coat. Therefore, it's got one dominant, so the dominant allele should show brown. Where, therefore, the recessive should show black. So, as I said before, if the majority of them come out as black, we would assume that the rabbits are all, that the dominant allele is black. But not necessarily. We need to do a Punnett square first. So, if we put their phenotypes in, this one would be brown, this one would be black, this one would be brown, and this one would be black. So if we look at this, brown, according to our Punnett square, would be 50%. We would have half the children being brown and half the children being black. Okay? Now, this doesn't follow what 
the question is saying this this doesn't follow what we would think okay but before we move on you would have got one mark for setting out that one was heterozygous one capital one lower and the other one was homozygous recessive two lowers that would have given you one mark another mark for completing the crosses correctly so a capital and a lower b lower lower capital and a lower and then cap it, uh, lower and a lower, you'd have got another mark. And your third mark come from saying whether they were brown or black. Okay, so those were three marks. Your second mark is coming, your, sorry, the second question says, comment on the difference between this and the actual outcome. So what they actually got was four babies with all black fur. There was no brown ones, yet we've just calculated that it was a 50-50 chance. 50% 50 chance that they would be brown, 50% chance that they would be black. Okay? So you got one mark for saying that what we saw and what we predicted were very different. These were two different things. We predicted 50-50, but in actual fact we got 100% black. Now, the reason for this is because fertilization, fertilization, where if you remember from the first video, is where the sperm meets the egg, is a random process. Okay? It's random. What this means is just because we have calculated this, just because we have said that it could be 50-50, does not mean that that will happen. It could always be that the, the black sperm, the black um, allele carrying sperm, meets the black allele carrying egg constantly, and therefore you get all children that are uh, homozygous recessive for those genes. Okay? Right then, so I hope this has been of some use to you. I hope that you are revising hard. If there is anything from this video that you do not understand and you would like help with, please do not hesitate to come and see me. Next time we'll be moving on to topic two of B1. So topic one of B1 is completed now across these two videos. Okay, thank you for watching.